This is a story about a missing volcano, and it's sponsored by Morning Brew. There are about 1,600 active or recently active volcanoes in the world, and in late 1808 or early 1809, we're not quite sure, one of them erupted and changed the world's climate. You see, when volcanoes erupt, they give off a large amount of sulphur dioxide gas, which then oxidizes in the atmosphere and forms tiny droplets of sulfates that we call aerosols. If the eruption is large enough, those aerosols are injected into the stratosphere, the middle part of the atmosphere, where they can hang around. A large eruption, whether it's high latitude or tropical, is going to put these aerosols in the, the stratosphere, and that will essentially block out sunlight coming into the planet. So that will cause, at least in the summer, a cooling effect. This is Professor Rob Wilson at the University of St Andrews, who studies how the Earth's climate varied in the past, specifically using tree rings. Imagine you look at a stump of a conifer. It doesn't matter if it's spruce or pine. You can see the rings very clearly. There's a light band and then there's a dark band. So the light band is basically the spring and early summer growth where the cells are relatively large. But then as you get this darker band, what we call the late wood, this is the sort of the final months of growth of the tree of that summer season or that growing season. The, the cell walls of those, of those cells are much thicker and that's where all the density is. But the amount of material in those cell walls is a very direct, function of the summer temperature and then if you then have a network of sites around the northern hemisphere and it's essentially you just average them together then that large scale response to the aerosols of the eruptions will give you a, a nice cold anomaly this has happened plenty of times before maybe once or twice a century for the past thousand years we see these cooling events in the tree records caused by large volcanic eruptions you know, Tambora, so that's 1815, and then the 1257 events, and the 1453 or 1458 event, they're seen as the big ones of the last thousand years. The eruption of 1808 or 1809, though, was different, for at least two reasons. Firstly, normally when a big eruption happens, the whole planet cools by about the same amount everywhere. But in this case, the temperature response was weird. So just as an example, if you look at the spatial cooling of 1816, it's pretty much everywhere. Not quite everywhere, but it's a sort of hemispheric cooling period. There's a couple of areas where it warms. The 1809 and the 1810 year, then you get some regions that cool very strongly, but some regions that warm. And you get these weird dipoles over North America is a really good example. And actually that makes it dynamically very interesting because clearly it probably wasn't as strong an event as maybe 1815 as Tambora. It was strong enough to cause substantial cooling, but then what else is happening in the climate system that would create this spatial complexity? Secondly, however, in those previous huge eruptions, we've identified which volcano was responsible, either immediately or through some analysis. The thing that makes 1808 so interesting is that we don't know which volcano erupted and caused the cooling. We literally have a climate cold case. But we've only discussed one line of evidence, when there are, in fact, three lines of evidence we can use to narrow down our potential suspects. And using these pieces of evidence, it's entirely possible that this case will be cracked soon. The second piece of evidence lies near the poles. Every year, fresh snow falls on the ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland. This snowfall compacts the snow underneath, and over time, those layers of snow get turned into layers of ice. Similar to tree rings, there are distinct layers representing summer and winter snowfall from each year, and so by counting layers down from the surface, you go backwards in time. But it's not just snow that you find in these layers. The sulfate aerosols produced by volcanic eruptions are there too. And so you can see in, uh, if you take then an ice core down through the ice sheet, you can measure the concentration of sulfate and you'll see there's a sort of background level of sulfate and then every time a, a volcanic eruption goes off you get a big peak in sulfate. So you get essentially just a little sulfate, bing eruption, bing eruption. So it's a great record of, of past volcanic frequency. This is Dr. Andrea Burke, also at the University of St Andrews, who's a geochemist. In her research, she looks at isotopes of sulfur. So sulfate isotopes are awesome <laughs> because they provide this beautiful fingerprint for a lot of processes that we want to reconstruct on past volcanic eruptions. So remember that isotopes are variations of an element that just have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. So sulfur, for example, 95% of sulfur atoms have 16 protons in the nucleus and 16 neutrons. But 4% or so have 16 protons and 18 neutrons, and less than 1% have 16 protons and 17 neutrons. 
Normally these isotopes behave slightly differently, a process called fractionation, in a way that depends on their slightly different masses. So anytime you have a physical or biological fractionation process on the isotopes, it, it follows a very predictable mass dependent line. One of the few exceptions to this is when sulfur compounds are exposed to UV radiation. That UV radiation essentially imparts this very weird signature that we call mass independent fractionation. And that really happens in the stratosphere. That signature that gets preserved in the ice core. So when we look at the sulfate peak associated with a volcano, we can measure the isotope its signature. So that's a sort of first order thing, but then we can get a bit more because in, in terms of getting latitude, what we find is that tropical eruptions really only deposit sulfur at the poles when they've made it up into the stratosphere because the poles are really far from the tropics. You know? And we can contrast that with eruptions from Iceland or from Kamchatka or Alaska. And in those eruptions, you get a sort of normal isotope signature, followed by the stratospheric component, if there is one. And so that's how we can distinguish latitude as well as, as sort of rough altitude from these sulfur isotopes. To summarize then, by looking at the ratio of sulfur isotopes in ice cores in the years following a volcanic eruption, we can estimate an approximate latitude of the volcano that spewed those sulfates out into the atmosphere. In the case of 1808 or 1809, this analysis indicates our culprit was probably near the equator, so that really narrows things down. But to get a definite identification, we need another piece of evidence. In a previous case, this was provided by written records. The huge eruption of 1257 was, for a long time, also a mystery. But ice core analysis indicated it was probably near the equator. In a great piece of detective work, researchers then found a series of writings from medieval Indonesia called the Babad Lombok that described a cataclysmic eruption of Mount Samalas sometime before the year 1300. They suspected this was their volcano. This suspicion was confirmed by what will be our third line of evidence, a fingerprint. As well as sulfates, another trace of volcanic eruptions get trapped in ice cores. Tiny shards of glassy material produced in the eruption called tephra. These are significant because every volcano on Earth produces a very slightly different kind of tephra. So we see like a real big difference between like arc volcanoes and something like a Icelandic one, right? So Iceland's sitting right on your mid-Atlantic ridge. Whereas with arcs, right, we think of the arc volcano, so all along the Pacific Ocean, essentially, you get that subducting slab. And that slab, that ocean slab, it's not just basalt ocean crust going down. On top of that is um, sediments and seawater and pore water. So it's got a lot of different um, stuff going down. So you can get very different chemistries and those are quite easy to sort of fingerprint. We have fingerprints on the crime scene. What we now need is a, a criminal database of samples of all the fingerprints from all the volcanoes on Earth in order to identify one of them as the culprit. But getting those samples is surprisingly challenging. A lot of times uh, the terrestrial record just under records, right? So you get erosion, so you erode away, <laughs> or it's covered by another one. Um, and so I think that's really where the, the challenge is, is that you, you can get, you can find tephra in ice cores. There's an ever growing library of characterization of tephras, but actually you can Im imagine the, that the sort of curation of this library is a, a, a very challenging thing, and B, it's not complete because the geological record's not complete. This particular volcano it almost comes down to a, probably a bit of luck understanding the geochemistry because, you know, there's probably tephra layers from this volcanic event. They can do the geochemical fingerprint, but then they need to have the same geochemical fingerprint from a known volcano. And if they don't have it in a database, they don't identify it. So some poor geologist is probably hiking around Indonesia or the Philippines or wherever the volcanoes could be. And one day someone will stumble across it. Sometime soon then, we may have an answer to which volcano was behind the mystery cooling of 1809. And if we do, then we might be a bit further along understanding other mystery events in our past climate, such as the huge event of 536 AD. There's no shortage of unanswered questions in paleoclimate. But if we can just get that last piece of evidence in the scientific courtroom, any day now, a climate cold case may just be solved.
As we've just seen, we can't make good decisions without information to base them on. But staying up to date on everything that's happening in the world is difficult. Difficult unless you get a package of the day's main news that gets you up to speed in just five minutes every day. Oh, would you look at that? Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter delivered straight to your inbox, full of the latest in business, sports, tech, investing, you name it all written in a really engaging, easy to read style. I've been getting Morning Brew for several months now, and I can honestly say it is a highlight of looking through my emails. It's informative, it broadens my horizons, and it contains a quiz. And I love a quiz. For example, recently I learned about the aftermath of Hurricane Ian, the collapse of the micromobility sector, and the new nightmarish tool from Meta that turns text into video via AI. Ugh. It's free, so there's really no excuse to not sign up to Morning Brew at the link in the description and make your mornings that bit more informed. With thanks to Morning Brew for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching the video right the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed this one because this was one of my favourite stories I've ever covered. Not least because of the cool isotope analysis that Dr Burke was talking about. Patrons have access to a bonus video of her talking about her research in a lot more detail. Would love to have included it in this, but it would have made it too long. So if you're not a patron, please do sign up. You get access to bonus content like that. Thank you to Professor Wilson and to Dr Burke for helping me with this video. Do check out their research at the links below. If you'd like to see some more stuff from me, then here's some recommended viewing. And that just leads me to say thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.